the salvation of the soul for every word that we read in that in his will. Uh, if you want to save souls, that's a pretty powerful way of doing it. Uh, I don't have time to go into these things in this talk, but we're just about out of time for it. And it's time for us to put all this stuff in practice by doing some praying. But now that we're acting, now that we're hopefully living in the divine will, doing our acts in the divine will, we can really get down to work in hastening the rain, its universal rain, all over the earth. So that's what we'll talk about in our last. Seen the uh, opposition among its own ranks that it sees today. 
You never used to see cardinals and bishops so frequently and vehemently publicly opposed to each other. Because again, as I said yesterday, the straight and narrow way of our Lord's way is so thin, it's so easy to fall off on the right or the left. We have to stay on that brazen thing, straight and narrow way of our Lord. The Magisterium, Our Lady's apparitions, we're going to be grounded in these things, we will be saved. But we can't stray, and we will not be saved. We stray. Um, and the messages to many uh, visionaries that are still receiving messages to this day, they keep rationing up day after day in fervency and in urgency. I think of the uh, revelation, I think of the messages given to Pedro Regis, uh, Luz de Maria, both of them in the support of the bishops. And uh, Luz de Maria, actually, I've heard, I don't know where to find them, I don't know if they're published them, but I've heard that Luz de Maria, she's a seer in Argentina. She has received a bunch of messages from Louisa and the rest. Uh, and you see them in my will all throughout those day various uh, messages as well. Uh, the, the time seems to be drawing near where they are awaiting a great event that will be the, the pinnacle of God's final effort of salvation. And many of you probably remember it called the warning. And the warning will come in the middle of chastisement. We have to first be in our knees by the to be open to the grace of the warning. But the warning will be a mini judgment, and it will show the state of everyone's soul before God. It will be like judgment day in advance, but it won't actually be judgment day. It will be God, it will be God offering an invitation to every soul in the face of the planet to come back to Him. Because so many people are so mired, so deep in sin and error that nothing else is going to work for some people except this cosmic, divine intervention. So this has been prophesied, especially at Garadel, but also many other uh, private revelations have spoken of this warning, this mini-judgment. And I can't speak in great depth about these things, but again, I highly recommend, if you want to learn more about the events leading up to the warning, and maybe after the warning, to check out Mark Mallet's blog. Just Google Mark Mallet, or come right up. He's written extensively. Um, so with, with just that urgency in mind, with that focus on the pivotal nature of these specific times, I mean very specific, like this year, next year, really specific, let's take a look at what is promised after the coming term. And we'll talk also, I won't leave out the hard stuff. Uh, in a few minutes we'll also go over what Jesus showed when we said about the chastisements. But first, the error itself. I'm going to read a brief quote from my book, uh, chapter on the earth. When the Son of God walked on earth physically 2,000 years ago, we only taught one prayer. The climax of that one prayer, which he taught, is a petition that some have hitherto assumed is too good to be true. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus told Louisa, through her all of us, that it is not too good to be true. That it's going to happen. The time will come, and his will is done on earth as it is done in heaven. Now most importantly for all of us, we have to live this reality in our own lives through the gift. Uh, but that does not, uh, that, that doesn't preclude its universal reign, which is what he ultimately has in mind. Not just that a few people live in it, but everybody live in it. So that this petition is fully completed. Uh, the glory, this will produce a glorious era of peace. Holiness doesn't, there's such incredible holiness, a restoration of our original holiness across the whole world. That doesn't just remain isolated and compartmentalized in our spirit. That explodes throughout the whole physical world as well. The entire world is going to feel the repercussions of this living in the divine will. The opposite is true. The converse is true. We all know that's the case. In the fall, God didn't create the world to, to be filled with such ugliness and death and, and suffering and and, and defamation as we see those are all a consequence of sin. So when the reverse happens, that consequence will also be reversed. When sin is eradicated, all the effects get eradicated with it. Now there are distinctions, and I don't want to go through all the details now, it's not a literal, complete uh, restoration of Eden throughout the whole world. Jesus says almost mysteriously in the to Louisa. There are certain distinctions we have to grant for Catholic Orthodoxy. I go through all those details in my book. I don't have time to go through them all now. But in general, this is going to look like a restoration of what was lost at the fall. Just as creation came forth from God's hand in the beginning, noble, beautiful.
beautiful and holy, so to return him at the end of time in a similar state. In the book of Revelation, we read about heaven as a banquet feast, as a wedding feast. Well, the bride, which is the church, does not approach the wedding disfigured, ugly, sinful, a mess. She needs to be bedecked, crowned with jewels. That, that is how the bride approaches the wedding view. That's how the church needs to approach heaven. Restore to her perfect glory. Restore to the original glory. And that's what the era is going to do. Jesus tells Louisa, If it were impossible that my will could reign on earth as in heaven, my all eternal goodness would not have taught the prayer of the our Father. Because to make an impossible thing to pray for, I would not have done. Nor would I have recited with so much love as first, placing myself at the head of all. Nor would I have taught it to the apostles, so they could teach it to the whole world as the most beautiful and most substantial prayer of my church. I do not want impossible things, nor do I demand from a creature, nor do I myself do impossible things. Therefore, if it would have been impossible for my divine will come to reign on earth as it does in heaven, I would have taught prayer useless and without effect. And I do not know how to do useless things. At the most, I wait even centuries, but I must make the fruit of my taught prayer arise. Even more, because gratuitously, without anyone having told me, I gave this great good, that my will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, everything I have manifested about my will is enclosed in these words alone, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is Jesus' promise. He does not promise things that don't happen. He continues to talk about Adam's sin. My daughter, when Adam sinned, God gave him the promise of the future redeemer. Centuries passed, and the promise did not fail. Therefore, human generations enjoy the blessings of the redemption. Now, by my coming from heaven to form the kingdom of redemption, I made another, more solemn promise before departing from heaven that the kingdom of my will on earth, which is contained in our Father, prayer. So what Jesus is saying to Louisa there is that the promise in our Father is a parallel promise to the proto-evangelium in Genesis 3.15. As soon as man fell, God promised the future redeemer, right there in Genesis, that the woman would crush the head of the serpent. A more solemn promise still, Jesus himself gave, gave to the world when he became incarnate. It's a promise, just like the proto evangelicals. So after I formed this prayer, I came back to Jesus' quote, In the presence of my heavenly Father, certainly he would grant me the kingdom of my divine will on earth. I taught it to my apostles so they might teach it to the whole world, and that one might be the cry of all. The promise more sure and solemn I could not make. My very prayer to the heavenly Father, may it come, may your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven meant that with my coming on earth, the kingdom of my will was not established on the creatures. Otherwise, I would have said, My Father, may our kingdom that I have already established on earth be confirmed. Let our will dominate and reign. Instead, I said, May it come. This means that it must come, and souls must await it with the same certainty with which they awaited the future redeemer. For my divine will is bound and committed to the words of the Our Father. And when my divine will binds itself, Whatever it promises is more than certain to come to pass. We have to be certain that this is coming, otherwise we blaspheme against God's faithfulness. The, re the redemption itself was possible because there was at least a small core of faithful Jews who were certain that God's promise in the garden would be fulfilled, that the Messiah would be sent. And sometimes that kernel was very small. There were very few people who kept the faith strong enough to believe that God would actually could be taken as a literal word. God is asking of us that, asking that same thing of us now with our Father. We'd be certain that He can do it. He's saying, I wouldn't have taught you to pray, may it come, if it was already here. Now, yes, it is already here in a sense. The, the full answer to any question of theology is usually it depends. In what sense do you mean? That's a, usually the answer to every question. The kingdom is here, yes, in the church, in our souls. Jesus said the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, in the Eucharist. Um, in another sense, the kingdom will not be fully, will not arrive at its full perfection until heaven, not even in the era. The full perfection of the kingdom is the beatific vision, we don't get that until heaven. But there's a third sense in which the kingdom still has to come, and it will come on earth. There are three those three senses of the coming of the kingdom, they're all true. And 
there is a valid sense in which it needs to come more fully than it's already here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be praying every day and may come. Uh, Pope Francis specifically even taught that, that yes, the kingdom is here, but yes, it also needs to come. Uh, I can't quote him specifically now, I don't have a quote in hand, but he, he said that quite clearly. I know all of us have said that, we've always known that, that it still needs to come more than it now reigns, even in the church. Okay, moving on. It is coming and nobody can stop. We can't pray with the fervency that we need unless we are absolutely certain that no one can stop God at this time. Um, we should also remember that this does not eclipse or duplicate heaven. The whole purpose of the earth is heaven. It would make no sense at all to like go stop piling goods and frantically obsessing over your health and trying to make sure you live long enough to see the error. You will enjoy the error much more from heaven than you will from earth. If you are blessed enough to go home to your heavenly father then, before the error reigns, that is not a problem. That is a good thing. You are blessed. Uh, the error has as its whole purpose forming souls for heaven as most powerfully as possible. That is Jesus' whole plan to populate heaven with saints. But that will be done most powerfully, most efficiently, most effectively during the era when his will reigns on earth. This, 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 this world was always supposed to be a saint-making factor. And it does produce saints, and it has for thousands of years. But it's not exactly a saint-making factor, unfortunately. Not if you go outside and look around in the industry, you'll realize it's not exactly a saint-making factor. In moment, it will be during the era. So the whole purpose of the era is heaven. In fact, I don't know if this is quoted specifically, in Louise's writing, but I can say with confidence that we will long for heaven more during the era than we do now. Uh, I, I believe that's true. We will be closer to it, but you know what happens to two magnets? The closer you get them to each other, the stronger they pull. The closer you get to heaven, the more earnestly you're going to desire. The world will be a glorious place. It will be as God intended it to be. But God never intended it to be heaven from the beginning. So it's going to be that place where we are on a pilgrimage. We'll be less of an exile, as it often is now, and more of a blessed pilgrimage. But we'll still be longing to return to our heavenly home. And that longing will be enormous during the heaven. It won't be an agony. It will be a great longing. Uh, Jesus, let's get back to the nature of the era. This is the nature of the age and the coming of the era. I'm going to read a quote here. Uh, from July 14th, 1923, in Louise's diary. Jesus says, the whole world is upside down. Everyone is awaiting changes, peace, new things. They themselves gather to discuss it, and are surprised at not being able to conclude anything, come to serious decisions. So a true peace does not arise, and everything resolves into words, but no facts. And they hope that more conferences may serve to make serious decisions, but they wait in vain. In the meantime, in this way, they are in fear. In 1923, think about the context. This is after World War I, League of Nations, they keep coming together, thinking they're going to make peace, everything keeps failing. But everybody was waiting for something new. The peoples, alas, with this, the peoples are impoverished, stripped alive, while they are waiting, tired of the sad present era, dark and bloody, which enwraps them. They wait and hope for a new era of peace and of light. The world is exactly at the same point as it was when I was about to come upon earth. All were awaiting a great event, a new era, as indeed occurred, the same now. Since the great event, the new era in which the will of God may be done on earth as it is in heaven is coming, everyone is awaiting this new era, tired of the present now, but without knowing what this new thing, what this change is about, just as they did not know it when I came upon earth. This expectation is a sure sign that the hour is near. And we do see that expectation everywhere. The problem is, outside of Orthodox Catholic views on this, and especially as is given in the Book of Heaven, it's filled with all sorts of errors anywhere else to find it. But still, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as the same goes. Across almost all religions, you see this expectation that something huge is about to happen. Even the secular are sensing. Even if you open up the secular news heaven, Seeing more and more articles about people realizing that something's got to be, that there's some, something is going to just collapse, something's going to have to replace it. 
Um, but I mean, obviously, evangelical Protestants are big and waiting for the millennial reign. Uh, as Catholics, we know it won't be a literal reign of Jesus physically on earth, it will be spiritual, through the church, through the sacraments, the Eucharist. Uh, but still, their fundamental premise is correct that there will be a reign. Uh, the, uh, there's the whole New Age movement, the very name of the movement, is filled with error and sin and ridiculous things as it is. Their fundamental premise is correct. The New Age is God's own promise. They have a correct intuition. Uh, the Buddhists are waiting for Betraya. The Muslims are waiting for believe that there's about to be this huge worldwide change with the, the 12th of the month, I think, from the them correctly. This is universal. Everybody is awaiting a huge change. The fundamental intuition is correct, but they don't know what it is they're waiting for. Only we as Catholics, who have been blessed enough to know who we revelations, only we, only we really know what this change is that's coming, which is why it's our job to Trump, because the more that people know what actually is coming, the more they'll desire it, and they'll ask for it, Enough people ask for it, that's when God will be one on that moment. Okay, moving on. Another quote. Jesus tells the weeks of so my dog, man degraded himself and lost all those because he went out of my divine will. In order to ennoble himself, to reacquire everything and receive the rehabilitation of the marriage of his career, he must enter once again the divine fiat from which he came. There are no ways in the middle. Not even my very redemption is sufficient to make man return to the beginning of the happy era of his creation. Redemption is the means, way, light, help, but not the end. The end is my will. It is my will is the beginning by justice. One who is the beginning must also be the end. Therefore, humanity must be enclosed in my divine volition to be given back a noble origin, her happiness, and to place the marriage of her creator in force once again. As I quoted Mark Malley yesterday, God's last words at the end of time will not be, oh well, I try. He's going to succeed. History. What is history? History is his story. It is the, it, God is telling the glorious story to the whole course of history. He knows how to write a good story better than any author. Uh, but even good authors, even good human authors know that the best story has certain elements in it. It starts with some original, beautiful state. Then something messes it up. And there's a noble, epic struggle to reacquire it. And the end does not come. The end of the story does not come until that beautiful state of beginning is restored. And even to pass. God, being the author of history, which is this story, is not going to fail to make sure that that takes place. Humanity must return to God in a similar state that came forth from his hands. So we can be sure of that. My daughter, Jesus says to Louisa, yet it will be so. This is, he's responding to Louisa's voice of concerns. The same concerns we all have. In some place in the diary, I can't remember where Jesus um, tells Louisa, look, I actually allow you to have certain doubts and questions, so you ask me about them, so I can answer them for the sake of others. And uh, that's exactly what she does with the king. She says, how can this happen? She said, quote, nothing new, which is good, can be seen in the world. Sins remain as they were, or rather they're worse. How can it ever be that all of a sudden, man would give death to all vices in order to give life to all virtues? Seems a little bit cynical of Louisa, but it's fine for her to say that because she's voiced the same concern that any, but any reasonable person would have looking at the world today and being told that a glorious era is going to come. It does not seem realistic. Very few people out there want it, first of all, which is why I've chastised this. But even that aside, it just doesn't seem realistic. Well, here's what Jesus says to them. My daughter, yet it will be so. Our will will have its return. It will have its divine generation in the human world. More so since this was our prime act through which all things were created. Our will will transform and regenerate the human world to divine. Will is what came out from ourselves. Will is what we want. All of the things were done in the second order. Order. Second order. Order. Well, this was done, established in the primary order of creation. At most, it may take time. Centuries, will, but the centuries will not end until my will attains its purpose. If it has obtained the purpose of the regeneration, the secondary things, much more so, it must obtain the primary purpose. Our will would never have departed from our womb if it had known that it would not have obtained its complete effects. That is, that the human will be regenerated in the divine world. It has to come. It will come. And we need 
to understand. Okay. One thing that's going to help us to understand, in case there's any lingering doubts about these revelations to Louisa and the process to Louisa, is that this is just like the gift. We also see throughout 20th century private revelation, we also see that error throughout private revelation. We see it much more than private revelation. Fathers of the church all agree with the last one in the one glory, a glorious era of peace. Uh, popes have prophesied it ever since the beginning of the 20th century. The very popes in the magisterium have started prophesying the era of peace. I kid you not. Uh, you, I gave a talk, you can look up on YouTube, the era of peace in living in my will, something like that. I went through some of those prophecies in that talk. It's also in the book. I don't have time to go through all that today. I just want to focus on pointing out for a few minutes here that this is a consensus of private revelation. It was done in the glorious era upon the world. Above all, I want to look at Fatima. Fatima, famous in Fatima, a lady famously promised that her man killed her triumph. Most people know that. But, let me just turn the page here. She said, A period of peace will be granted to the world. Sometimes that's translated an era. It's the way it's translated, it doesn't really matter. It clearly refers to an age of peace on the earth. Now, some people try to say that that only refers to what we're experiencing now, have been experiencing since the fall of the Berlin Wall or the end of World War II, which makes absolutely no sense. If you think that our lady would call, we have now peace. I don't know where you get your idea from lady. That's not the Teresa said. Abortion is the greatest destroyer of peace in the world. The greatest destroyer of peace in the world. It has killed billions since uh, the end of the world. So we are not living by any stretch of the imagination in the of peace. So clearly, what she has promised is coming. Some people try to say that this era of peace she promised is only a reference to heaven. That also clearly doesn't work. So I want to read a couple of quotes here. Um, some of the very few people have heard of, I found, is Cardinal Mario Luigi Schiappi. Not probably the most popular name. He was actually the personal theologian, the theologian of the pontifical household, household to five popes. Uh, very significant theologian. He's famous, especially for his defense of Humana Vitae. Pope St. John Paul II himself gave this cardinal's funeral homily, and in it he said, Chappie's clear thinking, the soundness of his teaching, and his undisputed fidelity to the apostolic see, as well as his ability to interpret the signs of the times according to God. So J.J. is specifically praising this cardinal's ability to interpret the signs of the times, and he is, was a papal theologian of the five separate popes. Here's what he says about that. A miracle was promised of that, and that miracle will be an era of peace, which has never really been granted to the world before. Our Lady promised us this era of peace if we say the daily rosary, practice the first Saturday communion of reparation, and live lives consecrated to the truth. Only heaven knows the depth of holiness the soul must achieve to tip the scales for the world of peace. The memory and era of evangelization put into motion a chain of events to bring about that era of peace promised at that. So it's hard for me to think of someone more qualified than him to know, uh, to, to understand the Orthodox take on this. He's clearly teaching that this is a reference to an era of peace on earth. There's no denying that. I quoted John Hacker a couple of talks ago as one of the most respected and prolific promoters of Fatima. Uh, the hastening and triumph Fatima, the era of peace promise of Fatima was like his whole motivation. And he was a very zealous promoter indeed. Let's see what he says. By Our Lady's prophecy quoted at Fatima, the Queen of Heaven assures us that the present situation will be reversed by the intervention of God, by His great mercy, by the intercession of the Immaculate Heart, and of those who join with her heart, with, with her, in her efforts to turn the world around, it will happen. The conversion of the world is sure to come. The world will become, by our conversion and his intervention, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will arrive. The triumph will be a conversion event that will be so powerful and universal that all will be compelled to praise God for the magnificent works he has done in his creature man. The awesome might that this humble handmaid possesses as she shares the redemption of the world will be abundantly clear before all eyes. The triumph will be recognizable in the total conversion of the world. 
It will be a historical event of such magnitude that it will make all former moments of glory seem like shadows. Again, that's John Hatter, one of the best, most respected promoters of Bath of Happy Memory. Uh, Dr. Mark Mirror Valley, a uh, world renowned theologian, Mariologist, Professor of Theology, Sumido, wrote The beginning of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is promised, as prophesied, in the 1917 apparition. Uh, this triumph of the Immaculate Heart comes from the words the Church approved apparitions of Mary and Fatima to the young Portuguese children and seers. He says, This triumph is hence foreseen as a dramatic influx of supernatural grace upon the world, mediated by the co-demptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, our lady, leading to a period of spiritual peace with humanity. As explained by the former Vatican ambassador, Ambassador Howard D. of the Philippines, 2,000 years ago during the first advent, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. When the power of the Most High overshadowed her, she conceived Jesus, the Son of God. Now, during this new advent, there's the mother of all peoples, co redemptors mediators of all graces, and advocate, who will accompany her spouse to descend into hearts and our souls and recreate in each of us if we, if we give our fiat into the likeness of Jesus. So despite a few voices out there trying to diminish the promise of Lady Fatima as nothing really, this is clearly understood by all of those most qualified to understand it as referring to this glorious era of peace. So it's, uh, so it's prophesied the fact. We had a prophesied at, I talked last talk about Blessed Pinchita prophesying. Let's take a look at a few more seers that maybe some of you have heard of. Uh, I'm going to run through it real quick here, but there is a seer by the name of Edson Glauber. He's a, uh, he received apparitions into Perenga of Brazil. These were approved. These are approved apparitions. And again, going back to Dr. Mark Valley, he was very inspired by them. He flew down to South America to spend some time with Edson and interview him and get to know him. And he wrote a book about it called The Three Hearts. In this book, Dr. Mark Mirabelli tries to summarize the, emphasis, the uh, essence of the message as the following. As the celestial messages from the Queen of the Rosary and the Peace continue into the 21st century, we see profound blending of themes which include both the words of warning, but also the promise of ultimate victory with the eventual triumph of Mary's immaculate heart and the restoration of world peace. As our lady puts it, the world will be renewed and a new dawn of peace shall take place. And this is, this is an approved apparition. Let's take a look at a couple other quotes from this apparition. Our lady told Edson, the world is already about to be renewed and a new dawn will arise for all Christians. The Lord is returning to fulfill all his promises. His kingdom on earth will be as it is in heaven. That was July 20, 2000. Strive for the kingdom of heaven not long remains before your and the world's definitive liberation from all evil. She said, again, I desire to have saints from my kingdom of love. The earth yet will be a great paradise. First will come the sorrows, but then will come the great transformation. When all will be renewed and all things be made new, humanity will be revived in love and peace. Thus my kingdom on earth will be as in heaven. So you approve that version to S and Okay. Gladys Perot, many people have heard of this. This was also recently approved. These are apparitions under the title of Our Lady of the Rosary in San Nicolas in uh, uh, I can't remember what country, a South American country. She had all of her revelations up to 1990 approved. So let me just take a look at a couple of quotes from the approved portion of her revelations. If man desires to discover God, this would be an earth of peace for all, because only God can make peace reign, that peace so longed for by man. The Holy Church will soon come to shine like the brightest stars. Glory be to God, make it known. The most intense light of Christ will rise again. As the Calvary, after the crucifixion and death came the resurrection, the Church will also be reborn by the strength of love. Amen, amen, you must make this known. That's our lady's words. Okay. Well, this is 
Can we do it in order to flame of love? Anybody heard of flame of love? So, excellent. Beautiful uh, apparitions of Our Lady in Revelations to a lay woman, a Hungarian wife and mother named Elizabeth Kindle. There's grace of the flame of love in this power of Our Lady to blind Satan. And uh, she's asking us to implore this grace of the flame of love. This has been approved by multiple bishops. The Archbishop of uh, Budapest, Hungary, approved the movement. Uh, Cardinal Sh Chapieu here in America approved it. And let's see what we see in these revelations. The Virgin Mary told Elizabeth that the whole surface of the earth would be dominated by the flame of love. The soft light of my flame of love will ignite and take fire on the whole surface of the earth. Satan, humiliated and reduced to impotence, will no longer be able to exercise his might. However, these pains in giving birth don't try to prolong. One day, Elizabeth was shown a vision and she wrote a diary. My heart overflowed with a huge cheerfulness. In my heart, I saw how Satan becomes blind, and also the beneficial effects that men will reap from the whole world. Under the effect of that glass, I could hardly close my eyes during the whole night. When a light sleep came on, my guardian angel woke me, saying, How can you sleep like that? With such a great gladness, it will shake the world. Satan becomes blind. Satan becoming blind means the whole means for the whole world the triumph of my sacred heart, Jesus tells you. The liberation of souls, and that the road to salvation will be open in its plenitude. Jesus says to Luis as well, during the era the road to salvation is open in plenitude. If it's a difficult to find, easy to fall off of, uh, dark path today, it'd be like a, a highway. And that's the primary reason, again, that we should strive for this, for the sake of the salvation of souls. Now, unless we enjoy it next time, that will be much nicer. But let's take a look now um, at a less beautiful thing, but nevertheless, which must be spoken of, namely the chastisements. They must come first. And we have to uh, acknowledge this so that we can prepare spiritually. But why does he do this? Why, does, why doesn't Jesus just, just snap his fingers and just turn the whole world into the earth? Well, as Father Hazel said, he doesn't force people. This has to be free. And sometimes the only way that people will freely choose to submit to God is by being brought to their knees. My daughter, courage. Everything will serve with the triumph of my will. If I strike, it is because I want to restore. My love is so great that when I cannot win by way of love and graces, I try to win by way of terror and fright. The human weakness is such that many times it pays no heed to my graces. It plays death to my voice. It laughs at my love. But it is enough to touch its flesh or take away the things necessary for natural life. But it lowers its pride, feels so humiliated as to become a rat, and I make it whatever I want. Especially if they do not have a perfidious, obstinate will, a chastisement is enough, seeing themselves on the brink of the sepulcher, they return into my arms. You must know that I always love my children, my beloved creatures. I would turn myself inside out so as to not see them struggle. So much so that in the gloomy times that are coming, I have placed them in the hands of my celestial mother. To her have I trust them, that she may keep them from me under her sickness under her safe net. I will give her all those whom she will want. Even death will have no power over those who will be in the custody of my mother. Now while he was saying this, he was always speaking. My dear Jesus showed me with facts that a sovereign queen descended from heaven with an unspeakable majesty and a tenderness fully returned. And she went around in the midst of creatures throughout all nations, and she marked her dear children and those who were not to be touched by the scourges. So there's a couple of really important teachings in here. First of all, chastisements are an absolute last resort. Jesus tries everything, everything, before chastising his children. He only does that if he knows that it is the only way to allow them to surrender to his will. Also, that there is complete protection in the chastisements through, that, through devotion and consecration to our Lady. Jesus handed it all over to her. He said to his mother, Whoever you want to protect from chastisements, they're yours. I don't want the chastisements to touch anybody you don't want them to touch. He's completely given that power to our lady. 
to be safe, to be completely devoted to our lady, is to be completely safe from chastisements. Doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be at all physically affected by it, but you will be completely protected spiritually, which is all that really matters. Even if you are physically affected, you will even find that a grace. We talked about how most people in the world say don't want you. Well, Jesus is going to try his best to win over as many as possible, but at the end, a lot of people are simply going to say no to it, unfortunately. There is, uh, he's not going to override anybody's free will. It doesn't mean we despair of their salvation. We still hope and pray that everybody, as many people as possible, will be saved in the last moments of their life. We should never despair of anybody's salvation. Uh, even, no matter what. Someone, someone who points a gun at his head and pulls the trigger, and might seem an instant death after, after a decision that he made, but guess what? In a nanosecond, God can have a 500 year long conversation with his soul. And that's plenty of time for a soul to repent what he just did. So we must never despair of any salvation. But still, that doesn't change the fact that many people in the face of the planet today, maybe even most, will not want to live in this heaven. They will, they have decided that their life on earth is one of hedonism, illicit pleasures, error. There is simply no room for people like that. God is not going to allow them to bring the world back to how it was before. So it does need to be purged. The chastisements are also necessary, Jesus said to us. This will serve to prepare the ground so that the kingdom of the supreme fiat may form in the midst of the human family. So many lives, sorry, new sentence. So, Many lives which will be an obstacle to the triumph of my kingdom will disappear from the face of the earth. And that will happen in many different ways to cast them of it all be the three days of darkness. Jesus doesn't specifically speak of that to Louisa, but it's revealed in many revelations um, what that will entail, wiping out a large part of the earth. But the key here, remember again, is that there is nothing to fear for one who lives in the divine world. Um, and that the era comes after all the chastisements infinitely outweighs any terror of the chastisements themselves. Let's take another quick look at the glory of the era. Because I want the last word on this to be about the glorious of the era. Because I don't have terror of the chastisements. Let's take a look at that. So I'm running out of time. Yesterday, I gave you just a couple small tidbits that talk about the clarity of faith, how the whole world will be so glorious that you will easily see the glory of God reflected in all created things. Just as even now, a uh, mystic can come up with a flower and have that. Everybody will, will be able to easily have that during the era because of how much the whole natural world reflects His glory, which is why He made the whole natural world to speak about Himself. But um, there's much more to it than just that. Glory of the era. We can see also that there will be no more ignorance. Jesus promises to confuse knowledge. He says to him, He said, Now you must know that one who lives in divine will will reacquire among so many prerogatives the gift of a few sons. The gift that will be her God in order to know our divine being. And that will facilitate for her the carrying out of the kingdom of the divine fiat in her soul. It will be as God for her in the order of natural. It will be like a hand that guides her in everything, and will make known the palpitating light of the divine volition in all created things, and the good that it continuously brings her. This gift was given to Adam at the beginning of creation. Together with our divine will, he possessed the gift of infused sons, in a way that he knew our divine truth and clarity. Not only this, but he knew all the beneficial virtues that all created things possess for the good of the creature, from the greatest thing, even to the littlest blade of grass. So with the return of the light of my world and creature, its gift of few signs will also return. Now many times those who enjoy the gift now, before the dawn of the era, many of these effects that should go with the gift have to be hidden from the soul, because that would be a distraction. It's about our spiritual preparation now. But there will be no need to hide all of these effects of the gift during the era and the university bring. One of those is infused knowledge. We talked yesterday also very briefly about physical transformation. I'll read this brief quote again. The body lost its freshness after the fall of the It became debilitated and remained subject to all evils, sharing the evils of the human will just as it has shared the good. So if the human will is healed, 
by giving it again the life of my divine will, as though by magic, all the evils of the human nature were alike no more. Whatever you suffer from physically, it has no place in the end. That too will be gone. Because all of that is a result of sin. And the results of sin are diminished, are destroyed with the destruction of its cause. Let's talk about death. Death during the era. We still have to die. Remember, the era is not our home in heaven. So we still have to go home to heaven. And that means dying. So isn't wouldn't that ruin the era? Not at all. Here's what Jesus says about that. My daughter, if a woman lives in divine will, earth is but one step of distance, such that when one least expects it, once that step is made, she will find herself in the celestial fatherland. Not like one who comes from the exile and knows nothing about it, but like one who already knew that it belonged to her, and who knew the beauty, the sumptuousness, the happiness of the eternal city. My will could not tolerate keeping one who lives in it, in the condition of exile. In order to do this, it should change its nature, the regimen which exists between one who lives in heaven and one who lives in the earth, which cannot do, nor does it want to. So what Jesus is telling the see here is that death during the era, it will just kind of slip over you when you completed the number of acts that you need to complete on earth to populate heaven with the merit of it. He says, death will no longer have power in the soul. And who will have power over the body will not be death or transit. So it's still death, technically, but he's saying a better word for it in the air would be just transit. Without the nourishment of sin and degrading the human will that produces the corruption of bodies, and with the preserving the nourishment of my will, the bodies also will not be subject to decomposing, and becoming so horribly corrupt that it's to strike fear and even the strongest one as this happens now. But they will remain composed and held in their sepulchres, waiting for the day of the resurrection of all. The kingdom of the divine fiat will make a great miracle of banishing all evils, all miseries, all fears, because it will not perform a miracle in a time of circumstance, but it will keep the children of its kingdom with itself in an act of continuous miracle, to preserve them from any need, and let them be distinguished as the children of its kingdom. This in the souls, but also in the body, there will be many modifications, because it is always sin. It is the nourishment of all evils. Once it is removed, there will be no more nourishment for evil. We, of course, have many intimations of that today. There are plenty of saints who are completely incorrupt. Well, that's supposed to be the norm. Jesus always intended that to be a norm, that the human body is such a glorious thing created by God that it's never supposed to decay. During the era, there will be decay. Everyone will be incorrupt. Um, I want to really run out of time here, so I'm going to skip a couple more things and get to what I want to say about its nature as a sacramental thing. Because we must remember that we are not millenarians. The heresy of millenarianism is that Jesus physically, literally reigns, or just the heresy of dispensationalism, that we will be dispensed from the current rules and traditions and dogmas, we will not. Uh, it is not a, a, a passing away of the age of the church, as Pope Joe and Fior said. So all sorts of heresies associated with this, because that's what the devil does when there's such an important truth. He tries to drown it out with a bunch of heresies. Um, it will be a glorious reign. It will be a reign of Christ. He will reign, as he does now, through the Eucharist, through the church, fully. Not just a little bit here and there. Here's what he says. The kingdom of my will be a true echo of the celestial fatherland, in which, while the blessed possess their gods, their own life, they receive him into themselves, also from the outside. So, inside and outside of themselves, divine life they possess, and divine life they receive. What will not be my happiness in giving myself sacramentally to the children of the eternal fiend, and in finding my own life in them? Then will my sacramental life have its complete fruit, and as the species are consumed, he means the sacred species of the Eucharist, the host, as it is consumed in your body, as it starts to, as the host itself starts to dissolve in your stomach, he says, I will no longer then have the sorrow of leaving my children without the food of my continuous life. Because my will, even more than sacramental actions, will maintain its divine life always, with its full possession. In the kingdom of my will, there will be neither foods nor communions that are interrupted, but perennial. And everything I did in redemption will serve no longer as remedy, but as delight, as joy, as happiness, and as beauty ever growing. So the triumph of the supreme fiat 
will give the complete fruit of the kingdom of redemption. Still the Catholic Church, still our faith, still the sacraments. But during the era, we receive them as they were meant to be received, as food, as the air we breathe, as the water we drink. Today, Jesus says most people receive the sacraments merely as medicine. It's important for sick and medicine. We won't be sick during the era. We receive the sacraments as the very nourishment of our life. And we'll be living in continuous. We won't have to have the presence of Jesus leave us after 15 minutes, but you'll always be our life after we receive communion. So at the end of this, I want to remind everybody one more time of the certainty of victory. I want that to be the very last word here. And I'm going to have to shorten this, but I'll just read one paragraph, please. Jesus tells what we said. We never do useless things. Do you think that the many truths we have manifested to you about our will with so much love will not bear their fruit and will not form their lives within the souls? Not at all. If we have issued them is because we know with certainty that they will indeed bear fruit. Bear their fruit will establish the kingdom of our will in the midst of creatures. If not today, because it seems to them that there is food adaptable to them, perhaps they may even despise what could form the divine life in them, the time will come when they will be to see who can get to know these truths more. By knowing them, they will love them. Love will render them food adaptable. Love will render food adaptable for them. And in this way, my truth will form the life that they will offer them. Therefore, do not be concerned. It is a matter of time. Jesus told that to Louisa in May 16, 1937. So, it's been a while. He said that obviously no that the people at that time wouldn't accept it. But we're at the time now, we're, we're finally ready. I'm certain that. We're ready to accept it. Um, it's going to come, and we're being asked to do what to make it come. So, you, there we have it. We've all been entrusted with the most glorious mission in history. We've all been invited to it. When we do it, that invitation's up to you.
That is a great so clearly our body speaks to uh, in truth about God Himself. Um, Jesus tells the reason that's true about right? the whole world. Every single thing created by like God was done in order to speak by one of his attributes. So certainly the body would be apparent among all of them. I'm not sure how to go into any more detail, but it's a good it's a good avenue to explore, thank you. I'll refrain from that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. When you wake up tomorrow and then you have a little bit more than that. Okay, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, let me, let, me give it, let me give that a try quick. So the morning, I talked about, uh, I'm always wondering about the morning in three days of darkness. And there's many theories about when exactly this will happen. Um, I go with what Martin Mel and Father Edu is here saying, I think they have the best take on this of any of the people who write on it. That the morning is prophetic, and prophetic error in God. It's a miniature judgment. We'll see the state of our souls before God. And this will be the event that draws the line in the sand. The chastisements will have already begun to some degree once the warning happens. So it's, it's not going to be tomorrow, it's, but it could be very soon. Um, I had a speculative post up in my blog a few months back that sort of a star collision in 2022 and, and how that seems to line up with something that the Sears of Garrett and Dallas told about this coinciding with the celestial events that will look like the collision of two stars. And astronomers said, the first time we've ever been observed, two stars fly in the year 2022. So I couldn't have noticed the connection there. Uh, I don't know, I'm just pure speculation, but it could happen. Assume 2022, there could be the chastisement having started, at least in one form or another. And then this miraculous event where everything is frozen for 15 minutes of that, so the whole world, everybody sees the state of the soul before God. It will be very painful, but it will be the greatest grace that has been given throughout the history of the church. And when this is given, everybody will have an opportunity to choose which side they're going to be on. The fence is going to be shaken by this event. There will be no more lukewarm people. People will go to one extreme or the other. They will become much holier, or they will become much worse. They will submit to the will of God, or they will rebel against the will of God after this event. And those who go on the rebellious side, the Antichrist is going to come and gather them up. And those who are on the side of God's will, they're going to be the faithful one. God will preserve for ushering in the kingdom of us. The Antichrist and his minions and everyone who, who receives the mark of the beast and refuses to submit to God, after God gives them every opportunity to do so, is going to have to say enough is enough. And he's going to do that with three days of darkness, where all hell is going to be out of the And uh, there will be no sun, no light. You cannot go outside for three days. And when these three days are up, a large part of the world will be Maybe some prophets say in two things, but we shouldn't get too stuck in the numbers. These things are all up to God to change according to our prayers. According to Hosea, we we pray now for the mitigation of the chastisements and the hastening of the coming of the king. We can change a lot. A lot of this is written, but a lot of this is up to be changed depending upon our prayers. Thank you. Yes, Yeah, so it's the cardinal that I brought up talking about the family and error of peace, right? So that was, that's Chiappi, C-I-A-P-P-I. -E -I. I believe he has, yeah. But he was big with the um, Apostolist Family Catechism. I don't know if anyone's associated with that. That was inspired by that. It was a devout couple somewhere in the States. I don't know if I'm going to go to the IV very well. So I, somewhere relatively close to here, it's the Bible Catholic couple wanted to start this whole apostle inspired by the and the promise of the uh, triumph of her immaculate heart. And he was the spirit director of the whole movement, part of the other person. So, yeah. Yeah, um, it's going to be so important. And again, this is not specific, not to my knowledge, at least specifically spoken of in Luis's revelations, but there's a number of other prophets to speak of, so we good to take it seriously. Um, I wouldn't recommend stressing too much about making sure your windows are sealed for it or anything, but yeah, it's a good idea to have those candles anyway. Uh, and there's 
said that only glass candles will burn, or we only light like them in half, or all three days of darkness. And um, the, uh, you know, it's probably like a small closure of windows and books. But above all, you can say the greatest thing we've ever for anything. Live in the divine will, we'll be protected by our lady. Divine Will of Life. 
Divinerealllife.org. Divinerealllife.org. If you drive a lot, there's, I haven't missed it a lot. I haven't missed it many, but I know they're really good. I know other of you guys. Just amazing. They're also on YouTube. Okay. You can listen to them while you're driving, while you're working. Um, Father Yuzi is starting to make more and more as well. His site is livinginthedivinewill.com. And, uh, and I'm just I'm just another guy, and uh, I'm just an introducer. That's all I have to introduce. So I try my best to introduce people with my big fat book, which uh, you don't have to read the whole thing. I have a really detailed table of contents so that you can just go to whatever you're interested in at any given time. There's no shame in that you don't have to read it front to back. Uh, you can give them a book. You can. It's free online as well. Just, just tell them the Google Crown of Sanity. It'll come right up. And Mark Mallow, Dad, he, I would highly recommend him. He doesn't focus on the Bible. He focuses on signs and times and, uh, and and whatnot, spirituality in general. But he does talk about the Bible from time to time. It's very good. Mark Mallow. It's M-A-L-L-E-T-T. -T. I hope I spelled that right. Google autocorrect. M A L L E T T. Yes, ma'am. Okay, he specifically has introductory talks in 18 CDs. So, yeah, yeah, if you use CDs, go for that. Um, yeah, so, and, and obviously, you know, the model, what I like to do, I just use a, um, Computer program to turn all of the books into speech. It's just an annoying computer voice, but I can handle it. And I just turn it on whenever I'm driving, whenever I'm working in the house, whenever I'm doing something that I can have enough of my mind free to focus on. I just have time. That's what I usually do. I love it. Uh, there's a bunch of programs that do it. Just, just there's a bunch of apps that do it. Um, most phones now just have something built in. I think I don't know. I, I'm actually very literate with that, that way through what phones do today. But, but you can just Google text to speech. That's something will come up. Text to speech. And if you speak Spanish, there's someone who's already narrated the whole book of that. I don't know how many Spanish speakers you have, but, but I know that's available to Spanish speakers. The whole book of that narrated by an actual human voice, which is nice. Maybe someone can start doing that. I mean, yeah, I suppose it might make sense to wait until the official translation comes out. Because word in the street is that it'll hopefully be very soon. It would be really great to have the official English translation from the church uh, in audio format as soon as it's out. Which again, hopefully should be very soon. Which will be a huge uh, promotion for Lucy's calls. Any other questions? Or shall we uh, proceed to... Well, I'll still be around. I'm not leaving yet. So why don't we... You can feel free to ask me anything, I'll, I'll be mulling around, but enjoy some questions. I think, can I say that now? Is it, am I right? Okay, I can say that. Yes, I got the thumbs up. Enjoy yourself. <laughs>